This video is sponsored by CuriosityStream and Nebula, both of which have thousands of amazing videos, including exclusive bonus material from this video. You can get access to both services for only a tenner. Find out how at the end of the video. Some friends were chatting the other day about who the first YouTuber in space could be, and I promise you this is something that's probably going to happen quite soon. And I recalled a conversation between Brady and Gray on Halo Internet a while back where they pondered this exact question, and I think they concluded it might be a beauty vlogger. Maybe I'm totally misremembering that. I probably should have checked it. I personally quite like it if it was somebody like Mark Rober with his engineering pedigree, his NASA connection, and bona fide YouTube A-list ranking. But what would that fever dream of uh, Logan Paul fighting Floyd Mayweather still haunting my nightmares like a ghoulish apparition. Did, did that really happen? I have a sinking feeling that the first YouTuber in space could be an utter spanner. So if the first YouTube astronaut is going to be an insufferable moron, why shouldn't that insufferable moron be me? Yes, I've applied to become an astronaut. This isn't clickbait, it's real. For no other reason that to have my sodding Wikipedia entry updated. I guess I should have known that publicly saying that I'm not a vlogger would have encouraged you wags out there to deface my entry, but little did you realize, Jushin Ashwin 1, that I know it was you, Fredo. You broke my heart. You might have seen a lot of your favorite internet science talky people making videos asking for your support to send them into space as part of space tourist expeditions. This is indicative of the changing way we are sending people into space. A wonderful science communicator, Kelly Girardi, is going to become a payload specialist with Virgin Galactic meaning she can legitimately call herself an astronaut, having come to it without any engineering or science background, as, as far as I know, which is genuinely cool because as I'm going to find out when I don't make it through to the second round of this selection process, the established way into space is insanely hard to get through. And a lot of the talk in the space world now is about democratizing entry into space. So this year, for only the fourth time in its history, the European Space Agency accepted applications for its astronaut training program. To be honest, I'm not sure that making a video about the details of this process is really advisable. I don't know about confidentiality of the process, it might jeopardize my chances, but I figure I've got about a 1 in 10,000 chance of being selected, but I've got a 1 in 1 chance of turning this into content, and at the end of the day, isn't that all that matters? Actually, I can tell you the exact statistics because they've had just shy of 23,000 applications for a tiny handful of spots. Last time round in 2008, I was too young and inexperienced to qualify. And next time round, assuming it's in another 10 or 12 years, I'll be knocking on the upper age limit. So this is really a once in a lifetime chance. Unlike in the US where NASA take recruits every couple of years or so in Europe, your chances are slim. There has officially only been one British astronaut, which was Tim Peake. There have been a few other Brits in space who went up as American citizens or with the Soviets. My friend Matt Gray made a vid, he didn't go into space, he made a video about uh, the key specifications for the application that you should go and check out. So I won't go over those basics, but instead I thought I'd just sub Carmen line wing it, that's a niche space joke there, and focus on the kind of health medical related topics, including talking to two incredible real life space doctors and analog astronauts about what an analog astronaut even is, so stay tuned for that. I'm assuming it's an astronaut that takes a record player and a film camera into space because digital just doesn't have a soul, man. Matt's video will tell you that ESA requires a minimum of a master's degree, three years experience in a relevant field, good manual dexterity, a second language is highly desirable, and I had to submit a motivation letter and a CV along with my answers to a bunch of questions about my experience, which is okay, but it's pretty laughable compared to my two guests later in the video. I kept my motivation letter fairly brief. I drew some parallels between the manual dexterity and calm head needed in interventional cardiology and being an astronaut. I shamelessly lied about this YouTube channel and said that it was about science education instead of the reality that you all know that it's just a vehicle for my questionable jokes. And I did talk a bit about my personal motivations in the letter, but well, that's personal and I'm not a vlogger. Maybe something for my podcast. I don't have a podcast. One thing I didn't mention is my tendency to provoke in-flight medical emergencies in fellow aircraft passengers. I mean, I don't really see how that could be relevant. But what about physical attributes? ESA and NASA have both announced that they're aiming to put a physically disabled astronaut into space in the near future, which of course would be a first, although disabled in quite a specific way, kind of related to the fact that you don't really need to use your legs in space. But if we consider the non-para astronaut application, unlike the right stuff era of those incredible early space explorers, you don't need to be a super athlete, just reasonably fit. I had to undergo a part med pilot license, which was pretty in-depth, especially 
especially for vision. It was quite fun, really. Unfortunately, I wasn't allowed to film it except for the waiting room, which is a shame because I'd never even seen some of the gizmos that were used before. But at least I can show you my ECG because believe it or not, it's the first time I've had a full 12 lead ECG of myself recorded. And for those of you that are into this stuff, you can see a pretty marked heart rate variability there. We had to try a couple of times to get the heart rate above 45, actually, because below that I would get referred to, well, to myself. Fitness influencers show off their physiques, beauty influencers show off their looks. As I've got neither of those things, you have to at least allow this YouTube cardiologist a heart rate flex. Johannes Kepler, who is perhaps most famous for mapping orbits of the planets, also wrote a novel in 1608 where he imagined astronauts requiring considerable doses of opium and cold sponges up the nose in order to survive the trip to space. I think that's pretty much the same system they use now, but also had something to say about potential astronauts' physical health. We do not admit desk-bound humans into these ranks, nor the fat, nor the foppish, but we choose those who regularly spend their time hunting with swift horses, or those who voyage in ships to the Indies and are accustomed to living on hard bread, garlic, dried fish, and other abhorrent foods. The best adapted for the journey are the dried-out old women, since from youth they are accustomed to riding goats at night, or pitchforks, or traveling the wide expanses of the earth in worn-out clothes. There are none in Germany who are suitable, but the dry bodies of Spaniards are not rejected. I mentioned the golden era earlier, the Mercury astronauts and their famous right stuff. No one really knew what the right stuff for an astronaut should be, so it was actually Eisenhower who decreed that the first men in space should come from military test pilots. He also founded NASA, by the way, and I say men because there were no female test pilots, ergo there was no chance of a female astronaut. In 1960, Look magazine dreamt of the perfect female candidate. Flat-chested, lightweight, under 35 and married. Her personality will soothe and stimulate others on her space team. It's not like there weren't qualified women. The Mercury 13 was a group of women who passed the same rigorous selection but never flew. Well, one of them, Wally Funk, is slated to go up with Jeff Bezos on a Blue Origin flight at the age of 82. It was announced just a couple of days ago. America eventually sent a woman into space in 1983. The Soviets sent Valentina Tereshkova up a full 20 years earlier. Incidentally, she went on to marry the doctor that did her space medical. None of the Mercury astronauts married their doctor, perhaps because his name was Randy Lovelace II, which I know sounds like he should have been making adult movies, but he designed the tests to select these first men in space. Dr. Lovelace's full examination is mind-bogglingly in-depth. So here are just some truly insane highlights. A prostate exam that caused bleeding from the rectum, referred to by the astronauts as riding the steel eel. Mental arithmetic while a 145 decibel siren went off in their ears, enduring 54 degree heat for two hours. At this point in the video, I normally tease Americans about Imperial units, but seeing as this is about the American space program, I won't be mean. And I'll just tell you that 54 degrees Celsius is the smallest non cotosian and sphenic number of Fahrenheit. Enemas, continual urine collection, lung function tests, ice exposure, balance tests, and extensive psychological testing. I know my chances approximate to zero. My wife isn't even that keen if I were to be successful on, on me going up. I'd miss my kids terribly, and I've read autobiographies by Samantha Cristoforetti, Tim Peake, Mike Massimo, Chris Hadfield, Scott Kelly, Gene Cernan, probably more than that, and frankly, I don't think I am the right personality type. Ultimately, your CV can, and your experience up to now can maybe put you in the picture for selection, but the final choice is more about whether you're right for the job, which is based on aspects of your personality, of, of your brain, that you can't change. So if you've applied, like me, and you don't get picked, like me, then don't consider it a failure. It's as silly as being mad at yourself for being too tall to apply. They're looking for a specific set of skills, and sadly, I don't think sarcasm is one of them. And by the way, I do mean too tall specifically there, because they are accepting people of a much shorter stature under the para-astronaut application, under 130 centimeters in height, which is 
Only fair, right? Because airplanes hate tall people, so it stands to reason that spaceships don't even let them in the door. If nothing else happens, wanting to brush up on my French for the ESA application has at least caused me to hit a 109 day streak on Duolingo, which frankly is as impressive as going into space, so I've already got something out of the process. I would really love to do some of the selection testing though, I think it would be a lot of fun. So let's see what happens. Obviously, I will let you know if there's any update, but I think we all know the result. Now, I know my chances would be significantly higher if I was American, but there's something I've always loved about uh, Roscosmos, the, the Russian space program, which ESA works so closely with. There's you can probably tell from what's on my wall, the crazy traditions they have, like every astronaut having to piss on the back wheel of the bus taking you to the launch pad when you're on your way to launch, because that's what Yuri Gagarin did on his way to that launch pad in 1961. So 23,000 applicants, maybe six places. It's about as likely as that hot Twitch streamer you're in love with hooking up with you because you donated a dollar. It ain't gonna happen. But what about if you wanted to experience the life of an astronaut without leaving the Earth. A huge amount of research into how space missions are undertaken can happen here on Earth with something called an analog mission. I spoke to two friends of mine whose careers make me feel very inadequate to find out more. Squadron leader, Dr. Bonnie Posselt, is a Royal Air Force pilot, doctor, and the first person in the UK to officially undergo specialist training in space medicine. She joined me from Dayton, Ohio, from the famous Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, where she's doing her PhD. I know, what an underachiever. If you want to watch this interview and the subsequent one in their entirety, head on over to Nebula, where you'll find both as a standalone video. An analog space mission is um, something that has been engineered either a, a place or an environment on Earth to replicate an aspect of real space flight. For example, um, diving underwater in a base that can replicate some of the uh, weightlessness sensations that you get in space flight. Out in the desert, you can replicate some of the actual sand like textures that you would expect to find on Mars or when you're testing equipment in a similar type of environment, but also remote and, um, environments like in, in Antarctica. If you're able to add in some communications delay, you get that sense of isolation that you would experience from an, an analog mission. So it depends on what you're trying to test and what aspect of base flight you're trying to simulate. Um, but it's a way of um, more safely and um, with reduced costs to practice and to train um, astronauts, um, but also um, use equipment and get used to it and test it prior to real space flight. Um, so obviously you don't want to take something on board and then realize it, it just doesn't work like you expected. So it's, um, it's a way of testing those things on Earth. I spent six weeks in the deserts of Amman on a simulated Mars mission. And that really opened my eyes and I learned a lot of stuff about base operations, uh, but also pre-hospital care um, and wilderness medicine. Then through the aerospace medical community, I met doctors who were involved in other types of analog, underwater analogs, Antarctic analogs, high altitude analogs. Uh, and we formed a working group based on our experiences to come up with kind of safety guidelines and some recommendations. So the role of a doctor in an analog space mission is quite similar to the role of an expedition or remote wilderness medicine type person. However, there are quite a few differences. So first of all, it depends on the activities that you're performing. So often when you're on a, a, a mission, you're not just hiking or walking, you're performing science. And so you need to understand the equipment that your team are using. So in my analog, we had a spacesuit simulator. So the um, analog astronauts were using this quite heavy spacesuit, uh, And we had a few injuries related to that piece of equipment that you wouldn't normally have expected. Um, we also had a communication delay uh, imposed to give us that fidelity of uh, mm. being on Mars. So every time I tried to get some, uh, or ask a question back, back to mission control, it would be a 20 minute delay to get a response. So that sort of communication delay does really impact your um, how you ask questions, it um, impacts your resources, your planning, uh, and particularly then understanding the need to stop simulation and treat something like a, a real life emergency. Did you have any incident like that? Yeah, um, I had on our mission, we actually had three incidences which really? we needed to break simulation. Um, the trickiest one for me 
Uh, so our the temperatures where we were were actually quite a lot bit hotter than we expected and planned for. And while working in the in simulation, um, one of the analog astronauts was developing some signs of heat stress. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it uh, it was very difficult for me as the sole medical provider without any peer support making the decision to you know it wasn't an emergency but it was something that required um, a little bit more attention and assessment but you also have to bear in mind you, you're still trying to conduct science so you don't want to waste the time and the resources of doing that so it's a really difficult decision of when do I treat this real life or when do I say, okay, I'll just keep an eye on it. And then we had a, a another real emergency where someone kind of came off one of the quad bikes that was a, a transport, but that was quite clear cut. But excitingly, there's not been much of this in the past in the UK, but um, there is a move towards some analog missions in the UK. So we're going to be having Blue Abyss being built, which is the deepest uh, 50 meters deep down at um, New Quay, which is being developed as a, a spaceport. And uh, there's a UK analog mission being developed for the Cairngorms uh, next year as well. Uh, so yeah, so there's lots of opportunities uh, developing in the UK. So again, um, people, if you're interested, then get involved. I think for the more austere first few missions, there's likely to be someone who's extensively trained in emergency medicine as part of that crew. Yeah. But uh, as, as you go forwards, not might necessarily. Not, not need it, yeah. yeah. The biggest way that agencies, space agencies, mitigate against medical risk is to ensure that their astronauts are the healthiest people possible. So trying to select out anything that would potentially cause an issue in flight so that the, the astronauts are um, as healthy as, as possible to um, prevent any medical events from occurring. Obviously, you can't um, predict everything, um, but you can try and plan it as well as you can for it. Do you think space tourism will will see more, shall we say, people of, of differing medical backgrounds going into space? Absolutely, and rightly so. Um, space really should be for, for everyone. Um, for the exploration planetary missions, no, we're still going to be having very fit Kind of your professional uh, astronauts going going on those but for your suborbital missions if they don't include a spacewalk if you're going up for a few hours if you don't have a safety critical role then absolutely the crew members the, the pilots and the um the crew members who are looking after the participants um will still likely have a much higher standard of, of healthcare required because of the um, activities uh, that, they're, that they need to do. People who have flown already, there's been quite a few space tourists. Uh, Dennis Tito back in 2006, he had um, uh, quite profound COPD. His medical papers are all, all written up and published and it's really incredible to see what he flew with. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, it's space flight. It will be for as many people as possible if, if they want to fly. Like Bonnie, Dr. Beth Healy is another deeply unimpressive person with nothing of interest on her CV aside from working as a doctor all over the Arctic Circle and in Antarctica, driving a Caterpillar tractor 1,200 kilometers across Antarctica, having already worked with the European Space Agency and now the UN, and she's probably better at skiing than you. Now, I didn't realize when I asked you for this interview that you're actually interviewed in, in both of these books that I've got here. <laughs> I just, I was just thinking, am I pronouncing this correctly? You you are technically classed as a an hivernaut. Hivernaut is that right? Or... Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Um, Hiver meaning like winter, winter mm. naut. and that's because I spent an overwinter in Antarctica, um, working for the European Space Agency on one of their space flight analog programs, um, the Concordia Station. It's kind of like the Australia New Zealand side of Antarctica, so it's, it's that side of it, and it's actually on the Dome Charlie Plateau, which is about 1,300 kilometres from the coast, and the closest neighbours are kind of Vostok, which is about 600 kilometres away in the South Pole. It's unusual to overwinter, and also um, even more unusual to overwinter in an inland station. We have much lower temperatures. It's about minus 80 degrees centigrade during the winter time. So it's the kind of cold that where if you like throw a mug of tea, it'll like freeze and evaporate before it um, reaches the ground. Um, And the other reason is that we have the long polar night there as well. So you have 105 days where we don't have any sunlight at all. It's pretty interesting. Like, so I spent a lot of time up in the Arctic before I went down to Antarctica. And I'd always had like no real trouble um, with the 24 hour daylight that I'd experienced up there. So I kind of went down quite slow 
smug thinking I'll be fine with the whole sleep wake cycle but actually when it's turned the other way and you don't have any um, sunlight it's really hard to sort of kickstart your day and so um, my time actually completely shifted so I ended up waking up at kind of the like for lunchtime actually all of our crew were waking up at different times which made communication um, quite difficult. It was really hard to just um, predict when you were going to be functioning at your best because it just made you really sleepy you kind of went into it was almost a bit like hibernating it took me like half an hour to like write an email or something and so when you were feeling awake and good you kind of just had to run with it so I'd do like 24 hours of work and then the next few days um sort of you know barely get out of bed or watch Game of Thrones. <laughs> wow I mean well, that sounds like being a student to be honest. Is that part of the reason why Concordia is particularly good analog for, for space exploration? Yeah it's definitely one of the things that we're looking at um, because of course in space you don't have the same circadian rhythms and sleep wake cycles that we have back here on earth um, and that can really disrupt the, um, your function and also a lot of the crew cohesion as well and that was a big thing that we were looking at is how that affected the crew dynamics as well. The significance of being there over the winter is if something had gone wrong there's literally no way to to get off is that right yeah exactly so um if currently you know astronauts are having a medical medical problem on the international space station we would likely be able to um, evacuate them within kind of a day half a day um whereas if we're going longer on longer duration missions and deeper into space then that's not going to be possible anymore so it's really looking um, at the effects on that in terms of how we um, care for them medically um, and also the psychological and physical challenges of that at Concordia there's two doctors so I was there to do like the anesthetic um, and the other doctor um, was actually an emergency surgeon who was also sort of head of the medical rescue team so I'd be the ones sort of going out sort of collecting up and scooping up the purse and then bringing them back into the hospital so but that is quite unusual for an Antarctic station normally it's only um, one doctor per station. I've mentioned a friend of mine on the, on the channel before not by name who was the doctor in an Antarctic mission who had to be airlifted out early because uh, there was concern that him and the mission leader were going to kill each other. Um, <laughs> And I just want to tell the viewers that I wasn't referring to Beth in that story. That's somebody else. Um, just, <laughs> okay. a lot of people, a lot of people, um, um, yeah, there was a bit of controversy because like they don't normally have that many girls going down. And someone did actually write to the station um, saying that they thought that I was an experiment going down there. It's only a young girl. <laughs> In, in what way? Like just having a girl on station for winter who was a bit younger. They were like, <laughs> they thought, um, yeah, but that's a whole different story. That, that doesn't sound uh, creepy at all. Beth has also applied for astronaut selection to ESA, and I asked her what the selection process was like for her Concordia mission. You sort of sent in your application, um, and then we got invited to Paris. Um, and then at that point, we had lots of medical testing, lots of psychological testing, and then of course, like a normal interview as you would a normal job. Um, but then after that, on top of that, we had a lot of training at the European Astronaut Center, and we're doing what's called like human behavior performance training. And that really is what we're essentially looking at is trying to optimize the human factors on long duration spaceflight missions, because a lot of people think that that really will be the biggest challenge that we do face when we end up going on these missions. Are you aware of any problems that have occurred in space? Um, there definitely have been incidences of where things haven't gone so well um, with sort of mutiny on station and, and certain things like that. So um, we're definitely not without a history of, um, of challenges in space, let's say. I, I, I think there have been something like 23,000 applications for <laughs> yeah. places or something. And it's nuts, isn't it? It's crazy. Yeah. So. Um, all the best. Good luck. Thank it would be you amazing much. if uh, I could say that uh, you were on the channel before you became an astronaut. That would be uh, a very cool thing. <laughs> well, likewise, you as well. I think I think that's been the nice thing, actually, about applying. It's just like there's been so many of my friends who have applied and it's quite nice to do it all together and other people have been like, looking at applications and, and giving advice. So I think it's going to be an exciting uh, year ahead for everyone. Yeah, fingers crossed and yeah, good luck. <laughs> Hi there, hello, hey, it's me, it's the astronaut. I'm here to tell you about, what? What do you mean already been done? Ryan, who, I don't know who that is. Oh, you mean the first guy to ever do a sponsor read? Fine, fine, can the astronaut bit. 
If you want to learn more about analog space missions or computer simulations of missions and all the practicalities involved with planning to put people on the red planet, Packing for Mars is an hour-long documentary that you'll love. It's a perfect follow-on from this video about ESA because it covers things from both a European and North American angle. And while Bonnie and Beth have told us about desert and polar analogs, you can learn about aquatic analogs as well. It's absolutely great. You can find Packing for Mars on CuriosityStream, who have supported me for a long time now and are sponsoring this video. They're home to thousands of high quality documentaries like Packing for Mars and one of the most impressive space sections you'll find anywhere with loads of titles about astrophysics, cosmology and of course space exploration along with really excellent documentaries about medicine, science, history, geography and loads more. You can sign up today for only $15 for an entire year of unlimited access and you get free subscription to Nebula as well. Go to curiositystream.com slash medlife and use the code medlife. Nebula is a kind of boutique store streaming platform that I co-created with some friends. We've got hand-picked indie creators that you know and many that you don't. Our Nebula originals are ever-expanding and right now I'd really recommend Neo's Unknown City, a really interesting and ambitious project about refugees which has been realized in the most beautiful way. Leon, who creates Neo, is the main guy that helped me with my German accent in my last video, by the way, so uh, please check out his. If you missed me mentioning it earlier, you can catch the full interviews with Bonnie and Beth over on Nebula in their entireties as separate Nebula Plus videos. Nebula allows me to do that, post extra vids that wouldn't fit on the main channel, and remember it's only $15 for both CuriosityStream and Nebula for a whole year. So save your Patreon money for other creators if you very kindly want to support this channel and get something out of it, sign up at the link below. I don't know if you've been able to hear the seagulls all the way through the video, but my window's stuck open. The remote seems to have stopped working and I'm right next to the Thames. So a bit of bonus soundtrack there. This is a bit of a different video uh, for me, wasn't it? It wasn't like my usual ones. I'm not really sure what you'd call this kind of video. Maybe like a vlog.